problems um, and the Markov state model. So you want to ask what the mechanism of the allosteric regulation might be. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the allosteric in a moment and what that is. It's a biological concept about um, how, how a signal gets across a protein. Um, and there are two major theories, induced fit and conformational selection, which this can tell us about. And uh, also we might want to know how the allosteric effect can be quantitated, which we can do using these models. So just to take a look at the allosteric interactions, um, in biology, we have this sort of phenomenon that proteins can bind to their substrates to make a complex, but some proteins aren't ready to do that just at any time, they have to get activated first because we might not always want proteins going around doing their business. We might want to be able to turn them on and off. And that is the idea behind allosteric regulation where we have an allosteric effector that needs to bind first and see how this one is closed. When this one binds, then this side becomes open and able to do its job. So this is the conformational change model um, which is the typical thing, but there's also the possibility that it can work and it can get activated in a way that doesn't change the shape, which may perhaps involve some change in the energetics or something along those lines that could happen in this active site over here. So we see this, this one's not binding with its substrate um, and then it becomes active. So it can happen by getting activated with or without a change in its shape. That's the idea here. And so when we're thinking about change without a conformational change, we start to wonder, well, what exactly does that mean? How would that be possible? And in fact, actually that idea is in a rather old one from the 1980s. Um, there's a relatively famous paper from the authors Cooper and Dryden who proposed that that could happen, where we could have the same average but that that average could happen in more than one way. And so we might see the average structure be the same, but the energy landscape that gives rise to it might actually be different. It's the same idea that if you have a, an average of a 90 in the class, it could happen by having you know two exams that had a grade of exactly 90, or it could be one is 80 and one is 100, a similar kind of thing. And if all you see is the average, you don't know which of those ways gave rise to that. So the idea when we're doing the, um, the conformational capture is we may have a variety of different conformations that are interesting um, that the protein has naturally. So that's represented by these different interchanging conformations of various degrees of being open, for example. And maybe the most open one is the one that's ready to bind to its ligand. So what we could do is perhaps we, if it were allosterically regulated, we might want to <clears throat> select out this B3 conformation, the one that's ready to bind the ligand. And so could we um, manipulate the energy landscape to pick the, sh the conformation that we want most of the time. And then what we see here is once it does bind to the ligand, it's going to be bound to that ligand and it won't sample these other conformations anymore. So this would become the preferred conformation, which is being shown by this orange um, trace here. So how does it happen? Well, so an induced fit the idea is, again, coming back to these little cartoons that we induce the conformational change by the binding of the first ligand. So we bind that and it causes a shift from some, conf some conformational accessibility, which corresponds to this shape here that's not ready to do its work, to this conformation here, which is ready to do its work, corresponding to this one over here. So the major questions are, um, what are the mechanisms of allosteric regulation? Um, we talk about induced fit and conformational selection and how can the allosteric effect be quantitated, which is something that uh, of course is very interesting and would be very difficult to ascertain from experimental measures. So we could use molecular dynamic simulation combined with um, machine learning using Markov state models in order to take a look at this question. And so in order to do this, we need to design our system. So we need a very simple system. Um, we've picked a PDZ system because it is in fact one of the smallest allosteric proteins. And uh, also we can cut this down into some pretty simple 
um, representations as we see here in this little cartoon. So we need to study the protein and then we're going to study the binding of the ligand without any help. So this is the squiggle is representing the ligand. So in PDZ, this happens to be a little peptide. So this uh, protein will bind to a peptide this well if we study this transition here. And uh, we could also study how well it binds to the ligand. So here we see it's also bound to the ligand over here, um, but with the help of an allosteric effector. So here the allosteric effector is drawn as this rectangle, a little hat. Yes, in fact, it's actually regulated by a um, another protein. So this ligand is a little bit large for the typical ligand size, but it is in fact a ligand, um, just a big one. And so then we have this idea that the that, uh, PDZ will also bind to the ligand, but with the help of the allosteric effector. And we wanna ask the question, how much better did it bind to its ligand with the allosteric help as it did um, when it didn't have any help at all. And so the idea is that uh, in the allosteric activation model, which is what we have here, that somehow this binding, the binding of this protein to having the peptide be bound over here and doing its work should be better than binding the peptide without any help. And, and that is the essence of what the allosteric effect in fact is. This is just a picture of our model system. Um, it is just a very simple little protein um, that has a ligand here. And, um, and these are some interesting uh, residues that are in there um, that explain how the interaction is occurring, which is being shown in the molecular detail here. So this illustrates how we can actually put this together. So here we, we said we need the protein, the protein and the ligand, the protein with the allosteric effectors, and then we need all of the three things put together. So this is showing how we did that. So some of the crystal structures are available, but the total was not available. So we actually had to do this by doing a superposition where you see that this purple and this blue are essentially the same thing. So we were able to overlay this to arrive at the APL system here. By the way, um, A stands for allosteric effector, P is a protein and L is the ligand throughout the talk. So now you're already familiar with generation of MD trajectories. So we started this up in the usual way. And um, now you have worked through many of these steps and are pretty familiar with that. So that's what we did. And we ran the simulation. We got 500 nanoseconds of PDZ. And this is showing some of the snapshots from the simulation. And uh, the next thing that we wanna do is check the stability of the trajectories using the root mean square deviation plots, which also you are familiar with because you've been working with CPP Tredge. And again, we have our various systems, P, P, L, P, A, and uh, B, P, A, L. And so what we see from this is that our RMSDs are relatively stable and also they are around two angstroms, maybe a little more but um, this is about typical for what we would expect from MD simulation. So we said, okay, great. We're, we're ready to do some analysis. And so then what we wanted to do is we wanted to um, in fact, take a look at the network theory. So we wanted to, um, so this is showing an overlay of the five different conformational substates that we obtained from the MD simulation. So, the question is, where did these five substates come from and how do they tell us something about allosteria, which is what the talk is about? So the strategy I'm going to take is I'm first going to tell you the answer. There are five substates and we transition between these and there's a role for conformational capture and induced fit. Now we're going to actually go through the talk to understand how did we arrive at that and what is the significance of what it is that we have learned from this. Um, this simulation. So in order to do this, I am going to use a toy model. So in this toy model, let us consider these uh, constructs. And let us consider that these represent the time evolution in the molecular dynamics simulation, the time series. And so what we have here is we have a variety of shapes, and we're going to let these shapes be representative of the conformations that this has. So what this says is that the PDZ protein 
not being bound to anything has two confirmations. Mostly it's circle, 80% of the time, and 20% of the time it has square. And uh, this is the order in which it transitioned uh, between those different states. And its snapshots are gonna be represented as blue. Whereas when it's bound to its ligand, it uh, does square, and it also does a diamond shape. And it's about a 50-50 split. And uh, here's another one. This is one that has the allosteric effector just by itself. Now, oh, it does something different. It's a triangle and, uh, and a rectangle. So this is divided between two different things. And then again, finally, we'll have our last simulation here, which is represented by the triangles and also rectangles where the colors, again, pertain to the constructs and the shapes are going to say something about the shapes. All right, so for the next part of our talk, it's kind of important that we've gotten everything up to this point. So I'm just gonna pause for a moment and see if anybody would like to ask any questions and also make sure you've, you've latched on to what we're saying about the toy model. Any questions at this point? You're all with me? All right, I'm okay. I'm gonna forge ahead then. All right, so here we go. What are we gonna do with this? So the first thing we wanna ask is how many substates do we have? And that's an easy question to answer because the substates are represented by the shapes. So we're ignoring the colors, but asking how many shapes. So we just count up the shapes and we realize that there are five substates present in four molecular dynamic simulations, and these are the shapes, circle, and so forth. So then what we wanna consider doing is we wanna group the substates into the bins. So what I've done here is I've put up some bins, and uh, each of the bins has a little sign on it, and this sign is uh, not actually a snapshot, it's saying that the shape of the substate. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through our simulations and we're gonna pull out any, um, any of the shapes that actually go here. So you see that we've kind of simplified this here because we have, uh, we've uh, rearranged the order of them. And we see that there are two uh, squares from the original ones. So we got two blue squares in here. And we also had squares from this construct, the AP. So we got those in here. Um, circles only came from the plain protein. We collect the diamonds, the triangles and the rectangles in the same way noticing that the colors are telling us from which simulation they came. So suppose you didn't know the number of substates yet. So of course it's easy when you look at it and it's uh, little circles and diamonds and so on, you can easily sort them. But of course, when we're looking at snapshots of proteins, we have no idea how many substates we have. So in, in real life, we can't just do that. So we need to have this sort of iterative refinement using some cluster analysis. So what we're going to do is um, guess the number of bins. One way you could do it, and in fact, is what we usually do is we just start with two bins, right? Because one cluster would not be that meaningful. So we need two bins, minimum of two. And then we just keep repeating the process for a variety of different number of bins. Um, then once you, and so, so those bins are representing centers of clusters uh, doing the k-means cluster analysis algorithm. And then what we might do is we might say, well, let's uh, sort the substates into their bins by root mean square deviation to see which one is closest to its centroid. And then we would assess the similarity of the substates within and between the bins. So the number of bins will be optimized when the number of bins is large enough to accommodate each type of substate. And the number of bins is small enough so that each bin has a distinct substate. So that's, uh, that's a great uh, conceptual way to say it, but we might need to be a little bit more um, rigorous about that. So let's just consider what this would look like. If you didn't have enough bins, how would you know that you didn't have enough bins? Well, suppose we had picked only three bins in this situation. You see that we might have rectangles and squares um, together and the triangles and diamonds together. But in fact, these are not very similar. And so the root mean square deviation between the snapshots within the bin is going to be large, especially in these two bins that have two kinds of snapshots stuffed into them, which is not very good. So we could imagine that adding more bins would decrease the amount of difference between the snapshots within the same bin. 
Suppose we had too many bins. Well, in that case, then we would have a high similarity between the bins. So for example, maybe the diamonds got separated out or maybe these got separated. You can see that the distance between these bins would be very small in the case where the snapshots are very similar. And so that is um, how we would recognize that situation. So what we do is we're going to do a calculation where we're going to compute um, the number of substates. And what we've done here is we're changing the number of bins. So we started at two bins and going all the way out to 15. And so then, so essentially what we mean by the bins is the, the clusters, right? And so what we're doing is we're calculating the distance between the snapshots and their centroids and summing up and normalizing for the total number of snapshots uh, that we have. And so it, what we can see is that as we add another bin, the error goes down substantially. <clears throat> so here, in fact, actually, I think we even calculated one bin here. So when we move to two bins, um, that gets much, much better, right? And so um, in the beginning, as you're adding another bin, you're going to substantially improve the distance between the snapshots and their centroid. That is, they are more cohesive because they are um, getting a new centroid that is nearby. But as we increase the number of um, centroids available, so the number of bins into which they can be sorted, eventually that, um, that new uh, space to which you can move them is going to not really give that much uh, better results because they're very similar to the ones that already exist. We get into that situation where the difference between the bins is very small. And so um, this is going to ease off. So what we might say is we might estimate where the good number of bins, that sweet spot on here is located, which is typically going to be somewhere around the inflection point of this graph. And so we see that that um, could be chosen to be five. So then what we're going to do is we're going to do another test. And so that test is going to be a bit more rigorous than just the calculation um, of the snapshots to um, to their own bin. What we're going to do now is we're going to calculate the distance between the snapshots and their own centroid and the distance between the snapshots and all of the others. So for example, when we are looking at the snapshots that are in substate number five at centroid number five, the distance between the snapshots and their centroid can be calculated. And this is the distribution representing the distances between the snapshots and their own centroid. So some of them are very close and some of them are a little bit further away. But the important thing is that these snapshots should be most closely related to their own centroid and far away from all of the other centroids. So this is the calculation of the same snapshots to the centroids and all of the other bins. And we see that these distributions are representing distances which are much larger. So as we step through and look at each centroid, what we should notice is that each centroid should be closest to its own. So that means that each of these colors should be represented once on the left-hand side and that the rest of the snapshots should be right shifted, that is much further away. This is not super um, separation here, although it's pretty good. So what one does is in fact, try it with the neighboring numbers. So you might say, well, you know, maybe actually it's too many bins. And so when we did it with the others, the, the distribution was definitely suboptimal. And this was the best uh, choice because we are of course, uh, required to select an integer for the number of, of possible bins. So that's how we can do this. We can also apply the Fisher test, which I am not going to show you today, but that also gives the probability that um, a distribution is uh, in fact what it is we say that it is. So. Oh, yeah, go ahead. For that, you just make the reference frame, the centroids that you're computing RMSD against. Is that that's what, what you're saying? That's what doing, yes. Okay. Yes, and the centroid is calculated as the actual MD snapshot, which is the closest to the average structure calculated by the snapshots that are in that bin. Got it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, sure. Anything else? Any other questions? All right. So next what we can do then is we can start to ask about the significance of this. So once we convince ourselves that this is the correct number of bins and then we don't have too many or too few, 
uh, we want to start doing some interpretation. So we're going to look at the overlapping of the uh, the MDs in the same bin. What is the meaning of this? So let us go um, back to this idea that um, we are looking at a protein-centered view. So what exactly does that mean? When we are calculating our conformations, we've of course run the simulation on the entire construct. But what we're actually analyzing, in fact, is the conformation of the protein. And what I haven't really emphasized yet is the fact that when we do this analysis, what we do is we strip away all the rest of the other uh, coordinates. So what we're really doing is we're really asking about the RMSD just of the protein atoms. So when we see those, they are reporting on how the protein reacted to being bound to a ligand, how the protein reacted because an allosteric effector was bound and so forth. So it's a kind of like a protein centric view in the sense that we're, the protein is telling us how it behaved differently in reaction to its surrounding. And so when we think of it like that, we can then start to understand how we might interpret this. So here is our simulation when we had a plain protein and here is how the protein behaved when it was bound to its ligand, right? So this is the job it's supposed to do that, it's, that it could do better if the allosteric effector helped it. So what we notice is that both of these simulations have in common this square conformation. And so we see that the blue one had two squares and the green one had five squares. So what can we deduce from this? Well, we're gonna put it on our thinking caps. It's like those little um, quizzle puzzles you might've done um, some years ago, you know, uh, figure, out, uh, figure out by deductive reasoning. So here we say, okay, so in this state, the protein did not want to bind to the ligand because in, in, the, in the wild, <laughs> When it binds to the ligand, it's, it's in this conformation and it never does a circle shape, it only does the square shape. And therefore it must be that when it does the square shape um, to bind the ligand, that that must be binding confident, ready to bind. Whereas the circle one probably isn't because this one um, is not binding, but these squares right here say sometimes the protein, when, it's, when there isn't a ligand there, goes in the shape ready to bind to the ligand. So I think of it as like a little Pac-Man, you know, and sometimes his mouth is closed. So that's most of the time when it's just a plain protein. And then every once in a while, 20% of the time, he opens his mouth. And uh, we might say that um, if, there was, if there was a ligand going by and the mouth was closed, he wouldn't bind it. But if his mouth was open in the binding confident state, he could bind to it. And so we can then say, all right, so the overlap is uh, 20% because it's only 20% it's only here. So we might imagine that it would transition only 20% of the time because most of the time his mouth is closed. And this tells us that once the ligand is bound, he has um, different conformation. So maybe he's like, you know, chewing it, right? Maybe he has a, you know, chomp and chew mode, whatever. Um, just some little ways to visualize what's going on here. Okay, so what we can say though is that it could bind at 20% of the time. So the significance is the percentage of times. And so we might say that the, the way that we go from a plain protein to being bound is that 20% of the time it's ready to bind to the ligand. And when that happens, it can then transition and be in this bound state. Okay, so it can bind to the ligand, but it's not not often. And so again, we're thinking about this idea of allosteric and the allosteric effector helping it to bind to the ligand. So what could the allosteric effector do? Well, one thing it could do is it could make the protein um, be in square more often. That might be one idea that you'd have and uh, keep that thought in mind. So as we look through our simulations, we see, okay, um, are there any other examples of the same structure in different simulations? So these are the ones we've just talked about, and this is how the protein is ready to bind to the ligand. We notice that when the allosteric effector is here, that there are no conformations shared with the ones up here. So it puts it into a completely new binding regime, something completely different. And so what we see though, is that this is when the allosteric effector is bound, it goes into Dime, uh, to uh, triangles and rectangles, okay? And we see that these here are all binding confident states using the same kind of logic because when it's bound to its peptide, 
it's always in just a triangle or a uh, rectangle. And it was already ready to be binding. So what this says is comparing the top half to the bottom half is that in the top half, it was only ready to bind to the ligand only 20% only of the time. However, in the bottom half, look, it's pretty much always ready to bind. So instead of doing being just a single conformation being ready to bind, there are two conformations, both of which can be bound. So maybe Pac-Man has his mouth open and also has, a, I don't know, chomping mode, all of them ready to, to eat the ligand. And uh, this, is, this is what's happening. So the, the benefit of binding the allosteric effector then is to convert it into a conformation that is always binding competent. And so that is where the allosteric effect is. All right, questions? Does that make sense? Do you follow how I did the logic? Is it possible that this there's just like some chance um, overlap of conformational states that isn't suggesting that those squares are more binding competent? Like maybe something far away from the binding site is is overlapping with the uh, the substates from when the ligand is bound. Yeah, um, I think probably that's an artifact of the oversimplification here, because of course, if the if the changes had occurred in in a state like that, the RMSD would would pick that up and differentiate that. Um, so I, I I think, but I see where you're going with that. So let's consider the overlap between the protein and the protein and the allosteric effector. See the overlap between these two states would be kind of, I think, what you're talking about because it would be irrelevant for the binding of the peptide. Do you see that we can deduce that whatever changes we see between these two, knowing that this binds to the ligand when it's in this conformation is what allows us to make that assumption? Yeah, yeah, that part makes sense. I, was, I wasn't sure if it was maybe possible that like there just was some common uh, area in their conformational landscape that wasn't relevant to making it more likely to bind. And this was picking up on that, if that makes sense. Yeah. So yes, it's possible. And in fact, actually the PDZ domain does have a tail that kind of seems to be a random coil that could do exactly that. The reason why we shouldn't have that problem is because, um, because we know that when it's in this, whatever we get out of this must be binding competent. So we can basically do a difference analysis and that's, and that's, that's why that should be true. Um, is it possible you could also have a correlated motion that is not involved? Um, yeah, I suppose it's possible. Um, in this particular system, we did actually raise that question and we did look at it in that tail that I just mentioned. That's the crib domain. And in fact, it made very little difference in our analysis at all. Um, it is something we have to be careful about. And one of the other things is that now, since we have done this paper, we actually also did do some additional analysis to get at the sector residues, which should which means we should be able to whittle it down to just the part of the protein that's that's the essential um, part of it in order to do these calculations. Got it. Yeah, I, I think I was thinking more for like really massive systems, like where, um, like there could be parts really far away um, that weren't. Uh, that yeah that the. We the run into this were... in MUTES, uh, which is a huge protein. It's about 10 times the size of this, and it's 100 angstroms across. This protein is maybe about 15 angstroms across. Um, yeah, there's a lot of extraneous motions, and so we need to resort to methodologies to remove the extraneous noise in our system because it's, it, it's a lot harder. Got it. Good question, though. All right, great, great question. All right, um, so the next thing we wanna do is we wanna think about uh, sorting by the bins. So we have our, we have our simulations, now we're back to our, our toy model here, right? And we say, how many, snap, how many snapshots of circles did we have? How many snapshots of squares did we have? And we have them, you see I have it set up like a little, um, um, a little uh, 
I don't know how you call it, histogram here, right? So we're counting up the number of snapshots we had from each one and uh, we line them up and it kind of looks like a bar graph now, doesn't it? Um, and I've done that on purpose because uh, we might want to in fact do that. And so now here we are um, back at our actual system. Okay, so our proteins in blue, our protein and ligand is in green, our allosteric effector bound with no ligand is red, and our um, tri uh, ternary complex, the A, P, and L all together is in uh, the black here. So let's just take a moment to sort of um, sort out what is what is really happening here. So um, I've kind of set you up to see this from the toy model, so hopefully you're seeing the, the similarities here. Notice that our protein, the PDZ protein, uh, is split between two different states. Um, one of them uh, is, has uh, almost 70% of the time, the other one it's a little more than 30% of the time. This one has overlap with the uh, protein bound with the ligand. So this is our binding competent contribution and the important thing here is that overlap between these because this is going to tell us some information about how readily it's going to bind to the ligand. This also binds to the ligand, but it has no overlap with anything. So that means that we can't have pre-existing binding mode that would go into there. So the interchange then must be occurring once it's bound to the ligand, and then it can just access another conformational state uh, through uh, thermodynamic transitions. Okay, so that's what's happening in the protein versus the, the um, bind to the ligand. So this, this half of the graph is basically um, binding with no allosteric um, helpers. Then once we put the allosteric helper on, then we, we start to see that this transitions into a completely second half of the graph. There is a teeny bit of green here. Yes, there is a tiny bit. For all intents and purposes, though, these percentages are really quite small. So let's, let's say that... Uh, that did split um, between the left half and the right half. And so then what we can say is that when the allosteric effector is there, it partitions the conformations between two different substates. And we start to ask the question, well, are any of these binding competent? And so we need to then look at when it's bound to its ligand under these conditions, which is the black bars. And we say, oh, look at that. Under both of these conditions, it is binding competent because there's overlap with the ligand. And so then the amount of overlap then becomes important because what we want to compare is you want to compare how readily was, was the protein able to bind when it didn't have allosteric help? Well, it was this amount, the overlap represented in substate C. But over here, we have overlap in both D and E. So both of these are binding competent states, whereas the protein by itself spent most of its time in a state where it was not able to bind to a ligand. And so then we can say, well, this must be where the improvement um, is occurring. And so this is where we see the allosteric effect. Okay, great. Um, but that's still kind of a very qualitative kind of a description. Um, could we do something more with the numbers that we have? And that's where we're going to get a Markov state model here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to say, well, we had five confirmations. We had five clusters. Those clusters became the confirmations. And we're going to set those up around this model here. Now, each of these states is going to represent uh, what was in um, each of those things, right? So here's our circles, here's our triangles, which had contributions from multiple simulations and so on. And we're gonna keep track of that. And we're also gonna take a look at the transitions between the various states, which we haven't really looked at yet. So we have our probabilities to be in each of these states so far, but what we don't have is we don't have the transitions. So now we can actually get the transitions because remember we in fact have the original MD simulation and these are our snapshots and we know to which cluster each snapshot was assigned. So what we can do then is we can go back to the time evolution of our trajectories and we can do some counting. So here for example is our plain protein and we're saying from snapshot one to snapshot two there was no conformational change. In two to three, there was no change. So that is our self-transition, which is this arrow up here. And then we can go from three to four. Oh, 
it went into a new confirmation. We jumped over to another bin. And so this is our little bridge to go over to there. So you see what we're gonna do is we're gonna count the number of times that we pass through each of the transitions. So here are the snapshots lined up. So snapshot one to snapshot two transitions this bridge. And then from two to three transitions this bridge. And then from three to four, that's this uh, orangey thing that goes over here and now snapshot four is over here and so on and so forth until we map out all of the transitions. So what we're going to do then is we're going to count the number of times that we traversed each of these paths. So we've done five self transitions. That is we went from a circle to a subsequent circle confirmation. And two times we went from the circle to the square that's three to four and eight to nine. And two times we went from the square back to the circle. Um, that's the nine to 10 and four to five. And so then what we're going to do is we're gonna count up these probabilities. So you could see, of course, this is again, the, just a little Twain model to do that, but we could in fact do that with the actual snapshots from the MD simulations. And not only with the single simulation, but also for all four of our simulation constructs and keep track of the transition probabilities that occurred for each of the simulations by doing it just like that. And when we do that, we get this model here. So what we are showing you is instead of our little cartoon uh, diagrams here, right? We in fact actually have the bar graphs representing the actual frequencies. And this is just from the bar graph that we looked at earlier. So that's what these are. And then we have our transition probability. So we're gonna have the transition probability for the plain protein. So these are being displayed as the raw counts. So for example, state A, which uh, stays mostly as a protein has 30, uh, 3,121 transitions back to itself. Now um, outgoing transitions, let's see, um, we have, here, 404 transitions into state C, and then we have 406 transitions back. So you see now what we have here is the raw counts. And so the, they're color coded. The blue ones pertain to the simulation of the protein by itself. The green ones pertain to the uh, simulation of the protein and ligand. So for example, our self transitions here are being shown at uh, 2000 something odd, right? We have, um, 1,975 green transitions. That's this green one coming back to itself. So, um, and we, and so this is how we can get our um, transition probability. So this here is in fact actually representing a network model displaying how our system is both populating each of these substates and also how it transitions between those different substates. From this, we can do some interesting things. We can calculate some Boltzmann statistical mechanics. So this is something you would study in physical chemistry and the StatMec course of the AP Chem course, which is usually your second of three semesters. And uh, it just has a really interesting way to connect into these models because what we can do is we can infer something about the energy based on the number of observations that we make. It, the basis of it is really quite simple. It's just that if something is energetically favorable, we should see it more often. And uh, that's about it. Um, this is a fancy way of saying that. So this is the probability of observing a molecule with energy E sub I and state I is given by, so this is the equation from the statistical mechanics. Um, and so we're going to have um, the um, natural E, right? So this is, uh, E as you know it from, uh, from LN. Um, and we have our energy state, negative E sub I over KT, where K is the Boltzmann constant and T is the temperature, is it's temperature dependent with molecules, divided by Q, which is your total partition function that is saying, it's basically a normalization factor. Um, IS here is our Q um, for our partition function. So this is basically summing over all five of our substates in the EI over KT format. And so then what we can do is we can take the ratio between any two of the states and that will tell us the relative energetic uh, favorability of transferring from one state to another.
And so what we don't know is we don't know what the lowest energy state will be because all we can do is calculate the relative ratios between them. However, we know from experiment about what the numbers ought to be. So we would arbitrarily choose to set it at um, negative 10 and then the rest can be solved relative to that state. So when we do this, we basically just substitute it into the equations. So here's a sample calculation being shown for you. Um, and so you see that the important contribution that we're getting from our systems are these probabilities that we can substitute in to relate the energies um, to, um, to each other to understand what this will be. So these uh, are then going to give us our energy wells. So the better the energy, the deeper the well. So, and just going back to that very simple statement we had before, if it's more energetically favorable, we would see it more often, which would correspond to the well uh, being deeper. So we can solve this for all the possible combinations, right? Because we can um, move between all of the different substates and we can get our, uh, our potential um, to go across to all of these different states. So here is the um, solution when we do that procedure for all possible combinations. And um, then we want to ask ourselves, um, do these calculations make any sense? So again, yes, basically um, it does because it should basically be the inverse of what we just looked at here, right? It's really quite simple. So when these are having a high frequency, it will have a low energy, which means favorable energy. And you see that we set our scale from negative 10 um, up. And the reason why we pick negative is because as a convention in, in thermodynamics, the negative things are things that actually happen and positive means it's energetically unfavorable and doesn't happen um, spontaneously. So this is what we have here. And so this essentially, as you can see, is the shape of this graph inverted um, which makes uh, perfect sense from what we know from statistical thermodynamics. So then what we can do is we can actually take these numbers and we can quantitate the allosteric, right? So, so far we've been doing it in a kind of a hand wavy back of the envelope sort of a way saying, well, you know, it looks like it overlaps more or less, right? It's pretty qualitative. But what we can do is we can actually take the numbers that we calculated using the statistical mechanics and we can actually compute what those, dif what those distances are. So. What we're going to compare is once again, the probability to go from the protein to bind to the ligand by itself, which will involve this transition right here. And so the amount of overlap, then we can actually in fact get out and quantitate by using the probabilities, the energetic numbers to go between the different states. So here we can, um, we can do that. So what we could do is we could just multiply the probabilities together, right? So what's the probability to be the free proteins? Let's um, a little less than 80%, right? And then we could look at the transition of that to the state um, C, right? Because that's where it's gonna be able to bind to the ligand. And then we can see what probability it would be for that simulation to be um, in that state. And so that's what this worksheet is showing you how we calculated that. So sure, you can, uh, you can do that and then then we need to compare that to the probability of going around this way to bind the ligand and you work out all of the states and the transitions that would correspond to this. You would start with the free protein and instead of going over here to bind, instead it needs to go to bind to the allosteric effector. So you need to select one of these paths down here, right, to transition over to um, one of the reds. And then the probability um, to bind the ligand, which is gonna be the overlap between the reds and the blacks. And so this is how we can work it out. And so uh, we get out our numbers. Now, how do you calculate um, the probability, the joint probability of successive events? Well, you just multiply them together. It's like dice roll. Right? You have one die and you roll it once and then you roll it another time. What's the joint probability? You just multiply. So what we're saying here is you just multiply them together. However, you might recall that we had very tiny numbers and doing small numbers on computers means we're going to lose precision. So what we can do instead is we can move it into log space. And so that's exactly what we have done. And here we're reporting the log odds scores. So what we did is we just took the log and then instead of a multiplication, of course, uh, moving to log space means it becomes an addition. 
And so it becomes very quick to do. And also it has improved accuracy because we're retaining the significant figures rather than saving the, the zeros in, our, um, in the places that we have. And so that is how we do this. So we can get out then our total probability score, both uh, in the percents or in our log odds scores. And then what we can do is we can compare between the two to see what fold change there was in order to bind, right? So now what we're gonna see is that the log odds for the protein to bind to the ligand has a log odds score of 10.4, whereas the log odds score to do this in uh, going around, around the square this way with the allosteric assistance is around 3.9. And so then we ask ourselves, what's the fold change between these two things? So this says that it's about five times more probable than the non-allosteric path because this is considerably um, more likely to, to occur. And in fact, there is actually nuclear magnetic resonance data in, uh, in the literature that actually supports um, that supports our full change that we got, which was really great. So then, to summarize, we have our conformational capture versus um, induced fit. So what is the conformational capture? Well, the conformational capture is that idea of something pre-existing in a conformation. It's that Pac-Man having his mouth open, ready to gobble his, uh, his pellet, right? Um, that's conformational capture. The ligand comes by just when Pac-Man is ready to take a bite. Whereas induced fit means making Pac-Man open his mouth so that he will eat it, right? So conformational capture, it's all ready to do it all by itself. Induced fit, something binds and forces it to go into that conformation. And so what we saw is that there is a possibility of conformational capture to explain how the protein can bind to its ligand when we have just the protein and um, it's binding to its ligand. And this accounts for this top half of our pentagon here. However, when we want to talk about how it works for the allosteric effect, none of these states overlapped. So the allosteric effector is not helping it bind in the same way that bound here, which would be state C. But once the allosteric effector is bound, it doesn't go into state C. What happens is it has an induced fit into a new regime. And that new regime so happens to have excellent overlap between when the allosteric effector is bound and when it binds to ligand. In fact, 100% of the conformations available do have some binding competency. And so that is what is allowing for us to have greater uh, conformational capture. But this suggests the Great Wall of Allosteri. So this, of course, is a snapshot of the, uh, the Great Wall of China, very famous landmark. And uh, the reason why I put this here is because this is basically dividing the way that things bind with and without the allosteric effector. So when we are in the regime of working with the protein with no allosteric effector, it's basically able to bind um, just by conformational capture. But in order to get to the conformational capture accessible down in the bottom half, what we need to have is we need to have a conformational change into a new regime, which then has overlap available to it. And so that is being illustrated by this picture here, where we have conformational capture occurring by overlap in the protein binding to the ligand itself. But in order to get to the induced fit, we need to jump over this great wall into the new regime where it doesn't go back and overlap with what was there before, but there's very good overlap between the substates that are available, which then allows for conformational capture to occur after the induced fit into the new regime has occurred. And that's what we learned about the mechanism of action of PDZ. So then in summary, um, we looked at the nature of the allosteric effect, which had both induced fit and the conformational capture. How does allosteric effect affect the ligand binding? The allosteric effector induces a change in the free energy landscape due to the induced fit by the allosteric effector and the accessible conformations of the protein overlap with the AP construct with the bound state to APL, which was very great. And it was greater than that in between P and L. So then we can think about how the population dynamics view can be represented. So we did the population dynamics represented in the MDMSM, which reports on both 
the number of snapshots in each of the substates, which we got by doing the, um, the cluster analysis. And also then we were able to represent the transitions between them using the transition arrows in the MDMSM. So the dynamic view then described by the MDMSM could offer insight into other problems um, involving the protein dynamics and allowed us to quantitative value um, about how the overlap occurred um, and what the allosteric effect was, which agreed quite well with the available experimental data. And this project, in fact, was um, a project I worked on with our PhD student, Bharat Lakhani, and um, his PhD advisor, David Beveridge. All right, uh, any, any questions about, about this project or about this talk? All right.